Hi everyone and welcome back. This is Professor Hall. So last time we looked at a summary of this book over here, Narrative of the Life of Frederick Douglass. And um, I mentioned to My Bondage and My Freedom, also by Frederick Douglass. He also wrote the book The Life and Times of Frederick Douglass and wrote, um, as we see here, for the North Star. So rather than continue talking about the author's life, we're going to talk a little bit more about what slave narratives were, why they were important, and what are some of the common features. So things that we find in many slave narratives, things that they have in common, even though each one is unique in telling the person's story. So let's get started. The history of the slave narrative. So these first started to appear in about 1760. About 100 of them were published before the Civil War. Some shorter in pamphlets and um, some longer books like the one that we are looking at. The purpose was to persuade the South that slavery went against the moral and spiritual values of America. They exposed the shared humanity of African Americans and their equal entitlement to basic rights. Now, we talked about with Uncle Tom's Cabin how Harriet Beecher Stowe tried to use sentimentality to show this same thing. So she is using a lot of the same techniques um, as slave narratives, but they're, they're done in a slightly different way. Obviously, her book being fiction and um, pulling at the heartstrings of the reader through a few incidents that may have seemed, at the time at least, um, as if they were a little bit exaggerated emotionally. Um, in 1789, Alauda Equinau, um, I never am saying that right. Sorry if I mispronounced it. I'm sure that I did. Olada Equiano's narrative became the first slave narrative to be an international bestseller. He was taught to read and write by his master and was allowed to purchase his own freedom um, from his earnings by his 20s. Um, and this is much different than later on where we have people who are slaves for life. The traditional... Um, setup of slavery was was more like this where uh people were conquered typically from a war they would be enslaved for a certain period of time and then eventually they would be able to purchase their freedom after such a such a period of time um but at any rate um he emigrated to britain he married a british woman and raised children and became involved in abolition um greatly influencing britain and so there he is Gustavus Versa, other name. So around this time, they started to become more popular. In 1845, Frederick Douglass published the narrative of the life of Frederick Douglass. Um, in 1853, Solomon Northrup's 12 Years a Slave. In 1861, Incidents of a Life of a Slave Girl by Harriet Jacobs. This was the first narrative published by a woman. It was also published as a serial. So what would happen with serials is that you would get, instead of a book, things would come out um, in pieces. Many books of that we know today <laughs> were actually originally published in this form so that it would keep readers kind of on the edge of their seats waiting every week when the paper came out or um, every day to get the next installment. And her book features... Um, issues of rape, having children as a way of increasing a master's property, seeing children forced into slavery by their own fathers, which we see a tiny bit in, in, in Douglas's narrative, certainly when he talks about his own parentage and his mother um, being ripped away from his mother. We definitely see it again in um, Harriet Beecher Stowe's book, which was published just a few years before this, where... Um, um, Eliza is trying to rescue Harry from, from this fate of being taken away. Um, and then we meet again um, Emmeline and Cassie where some of these issues come up as well. And there's Harriet Jacobs later on in her life. 
In the 1930s, the Federal Writers Project attempted to collect oral histories from people who had formerly been slaves in order to preserve um, the memories of that time period. Now, we see something similar come up in the Holocaust, where we have the Holocaust Remembrance Project. Um, and to be honest, I know of right now, um, we're in the middle of COVID-19 um, and the coronavirus, there are groups who are um, collecting histories of people, oral histories from people who have lost loved ones and who have been affected by the virus. So this is something that um, we we see throughout American history. But this project, I mean, 2,500, over 2,000 oral histories were collected so the slave narratives even were published well into really the 1950s of people who wanted to talk about their experiences and and also by the 1950s right we're starting to see the beginnings of the civil rights movement and um how these narratives these later these these later narratives um were published to kind of increase awareness about what african americans had been through and why civil rights were so important So how do they influence the abolitionist movement? There's a person um, speaking on abolition. Previously, Northerners were exposed to kind of idyllic pictures of happy Southern slaves who were kind of simple-minded folks. We talked about that racist stereotype of Africans as being um, like children. And they were portrayed as being generally well treated, truly a part of their master's family. So much so, that in fact, Nathaniel Hawthorne, who wrote The Scarlet Letter, as well as other books, but that's what, am, what I find many of my students know him for. So he said that the kindness of current slave owners, quote, modified and softened the institution, making it a patriarchal and almost beautiful peculiarity of the times. Now, we think of the word patriarchal sometimes as negative in our society, but what it really means is um, a father system. So what he's saying is that the slave owners are almost like fathers, and this is kind of a peculiar institution, but it's a beautiful one. These people are being taken care of, right? So this picture that we get of um, happy slaves singing on the plantation, um, Gone with the Wind kind of has this sort of picture um, that Mammy and Gone with the Wind is almost like a family member. There were I would suspect a few slaves that were treated this way, but for the most part, um, even so, they didn't have freedom to do anything or make choices. And as we saw in this book and the previous book, um, they really are at the whims of their masters as to where they go, what they do, whether they are allowed to work, what kind of work they're allowed to take. Um, they're not allowed to read or write or any of those things. Slave narratives really then became a voice of reality for the abolitionist movement. So this small group of people at first that said that slavery was wrong, and by having these books published, more and more people understood what was actually going on. So accurately portraying the horrors that was slavery. Men often had to endure beatings, um, death. We talked about Denby, the slave who is murdered, laboring for hours without rest, laboring while sick. Um, they're denied being allowed to get married, um, depending on if they perhaps um, fall in love with someone who lives on a different plantation. It would be a question as to who would own those children, and their masters might want them to marry someone on their own plantation. Um, forced to give up their children, um, harsh labor conditions, rape at a very young age, we won't even get into um, Thomas Jefferson and Sally Hemings, which is portrayed often as a love relationship, but he <laughs> he met her when he was she was 14 or 15, and um, she was his property. Denial of marriage for them is yet, well, using them as breeding stock to increase their master's wealth, seeing their children being taken for them or similarly abused. I'm reading this in almost a rather other cold way it's a difficult thing to talk about and I um I don't I don't know how else to read it <laughs> without getting too too upset at any rate 
Um, the narratives gave Northerners a glimpse into slave communities, the love between family members, the respect for elders, the bonds between friends that slavery pulled apart or destroyed. Now, in Frederick Douglass's book, he has been kind of taken away from much of his family at various times, though he does talk about his mother coming to see him walking 12 miles just to lay next to him for an hour at night to have at least that little bit of contact because he's been ripped away from her. <clears throat> Seeing his aunt being beaten, his mother's sister, um, and the effect that that has on him as a very young child. And then, of course, his grandmother, who was basically set out to the, the a cabin in the woods to die once she became too old. And you see how these familial bonds could have been strengthened and purposefully were not. So some features of the genre, they almost always begin with an introduction written by a white wealthy editor, or they might end with a letter from a white person stating the true nature or authenticity. Now, this would have been um, important at the time because the thought would have been that a black person telling their own story, maybe they're making things up, it hasn't been verified, right? So um, unfortunately, this was almost a requirement that this editor has proof in one way or another that this is true. In the case of Frederick Douglass, not only does he, the editor here, say that it is true, but he also says in many of these slave narratives, names have been left out um, or they have been changed. And Douglas has chosen not to do that. He has chosen to use the real names of the people involved, and that would have put him in a very dangerous position. One, because um, the, he could have been recaptured, even though I believe this is before the Fugitive Slave Act. Um, two, because they could have really sought revenge um, for what he was writing. And he compares it to signing your real name on the Declaration of Independence that give me liberty or give me death, um, as Patrick Henry said, is not just a, a vague concept. This is really a, a truth in this man's life. He is either going to have liberty or he's going to die trying. They show commitment to both physical and intellectual freedom. So demonstrating the mastery of the language, the ability to write their own history, showing that they have grown in some way um, through education very often, either self-education or at one point having um, a master or the children of a master in some cases teach them. So the idea that they are not physically free, they are not intellectually free, and also showing how um, slavery hurts them spiritually, which would have really impacted Christian readers at the time. Slavery is documented as a condition where there are extreme horrors which necessitate increasingly forceful resistance. So this is something that we have to fight, that it is, um, how do I put this? If a slave has hit a master in retaliation that that it's not wrong for a black man to hit a white man um that these are horrors and if a white man were in this person's position they would fight just as hard so not exactly advocating violence but showing that running away is the right thing to do and um, forcefully resisting um this is a picture of the marks on a on a slave's back, um, the scars from, from various whippings. So yes, forceful resistance. After detailing an escape, the slave's attainment of freedom is signaled not only just by reaching the free states of the North, but by taking a new name and dedication to anti-slavery activism. So showing now that I have been freed, I'm going to help others as well. And Douglas's name is taken from, last name is taken from a book. Um, Again, showing that he um, has the intellect to um, not only choose a name, but choose a, a name with literary significance. <laughs> 
Um, in my husband's family, they had someone who um, they're not sure from the records if this person was born free or if they somehow escaped slavery, but their last name was Freedman, which was a common name to take. Other names that people took were um, names of great great Americans to show their American identity. So Washington and um, Franklin and, and things of that nature. Um, in his family tree, it was, I believe, Benjamin Franklin Friedman. So <laughs> taking on both um, the idea that you are a freedman and also that you're real, somehow you can have the aspirations to be like these um, these great men of American legend and history. Other features of the genre, dealing with issues of hypocrisy, particularly in religion where slave slaves are Christian and they see the unchristian actions of their owners. So in this case, um, Frederick Douglass is a man of faith and we see various uses of Christianity um, where people are hypocrites and where they are using the idea of religion to control people. So he makes it very clear in the final chapter, um, the, the postscript or the appendix, that this is not the Christianity of Christ or the Bible, that this is really um, an institution just being used. And I think you can see that um, today, how certain religions are used for control rather than to become closer to God. Accommodating masters and the feelings of resentment and rebellion that come as a result. So we see this especially with Covey being beaten down, um, having this taken away, and um, having your spirit broken and starting to really feel resentful. Again, trying to show people what the slaves were feeling. The psychological and social pressures of both slave and slave owners. So one of the interesting things he does in this book is try to make you sympathetic for some of these slave owners, particularly Mrs. Ald, who has really quite a lot of sympathy at first. And to the detriment of her spirit, is slowly um, used to this system and becomes more and more cruel. Describing strong family ties human emotions, and enduring truly African-American culture expressed through family, music, folk tales, and religion. So um, we see a little bit of that in this book with um, descriptions of music. Um, I think, sorry, my phone. I think in other books, some of this culture is expressed a little bit more, and certainly we get more detail in My Bondage and My Freedom. The Federal Writers Project, as I said, collected narratives into the 1950s. So here are some uh, pictures of people who were born into slavery who uh, shared their narratives. And really, the books influenced other novels later on. So Uncle Tom's Cabin, which was written after this, but before Harriet Jacobs' book, um, Beloved, which I mentioned before um, by Toni Morrison in 1987, and certainly um, an influence on things today um, with the Black Lives Matter movement and Last year, even, um, or, oh, I'm sorry, this year, rather, during the 4th of July, they republished in many papers um, Frederick Douglass's essay, What to a Slave is the 4th of July? And a lot of influences, well, I left it out here, but the civil rights movement. So different times in history where people have a better understanding that these um, inequalities did not go away after the abolition of slavery, um, certainly, especially right after when we had um, a lot of turmoil. And I think you can see the effects of this even today in many different ways and aspects of life. So that is it for this presentation. Next time, as I said, I'll be doing a short face-to-face talk about a few more of the themes of this book and things that I'd like you to look for. That's it. Thanks, everybody.